and uh, here on mathematics of beauty. And you hear afterwards will be the first lecture, um, sculpture in four dimensions by Henry Segerman. And then after that will be the second main lecture. Uh, and minimal and Seifert surfaces. But there will be short break, yes, but there won't be time to go out of it here or anything like that. Because at the end of the whole business at 5 o'clock, there will be a wine reception upstairs at the Atia Gallery. Ask for Michael very nicely, he might explain some of the things. At any rate, Michael, would you like to start? Well, this is a double bill. Two things of the word. First, the two speakers. Secondly, the two topics, topology and art. Uh, and Andrew kindly suggested that I just say a few words about uh, beauty in mathematics. It's something that I have difficulty in compressing into 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> I've allowed 10 minutes, taken away from the speaker's time. Um, math, I've, 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 there are many mathematicians and many people who've commented on the uh, importance of, of beauty in mathematics. Uh, there are many quotations. For example, Herman Weil said that uh, in his work he always pursued two objectives, truth and beauty. But when in doubt, he chose beauty. <laughs> uh, and uh, Karl Weierstrass, who was this epitome of the strong Germanic tradition and hard analysis, said that um, nobody can be a real mathematician unless he has a soul of a poet. So all these hard-bitten mathematicians um, you know, understood the importance of beauty. Uh, G. H. Hardy said that there is no permanent place in mathematics, for ugly mathematics. Um, so we all know mathematicians know you know so what beauty is in mathematics. We know what a beautiful thing is. We know what a beautiful, not only a beautiful object, we say exhibits nice symmetry and uh, artistic appearance, but a beautiful idea, something where the concept itself is beautiful, where the argument is beautiful, where you're a beautiful proof leading to a beautiful result. All these things are, are we understand as working mathematicians. Um, and uh, they, they, they play a role in our lives, in our work. Uh, and it's much more than just a sort of um, add on, you know, nice, nice new sort of draw pretty pictures. It's much more fundamental than that. Um, and the role of math, beauty in mathematics, I think, is quite profound. Uh, we, we always Hunting is the most beautiful thing. When we try to improve a theorem, we're trying to make it more beautiful. When somebody gives you an ugly proof, you try and clean it up. But everything we do is concerned with uh, presenting things in the most attractive, <coughs> beautiful way. And that is an important part of the mathematical process. It's an important part not only of the process of explanation, but also that of creation. When mathematics is trying to do something, he's searching very hard in a messy pit and trying to pull out beautiful gems and jewels. So it's part of the whole process of creation. Well, the whole the question is really that the science of beauty. It's about the interrelationship of not, beauty, not only mathematics, but with the whole of science. And it, 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 it starts off with some um, fundamental work done by some colleagues of mine, University College London, who uh, found out, discovered that in the human brain, um, the, the part of the brain that identifies beauty which you can sort of pinpoint by various um, scans, um, is, is in fact common both in the beauty in mathematics and in art. So that when we talk about things being beautiful, using the word that's usually applied to conventional art, painting, poetry, music, and we you might think it's just an analogy, but it isn't. It is a fundamental neurological basis. It's the same part of the brain that really describes the notion of beauty Different topics. So when we're doing things in mathematics, our, our brain really is like the brain of an artist, and that's that's part of the. And that by the way, that art, that paper which was written, which I jointly authored because I was uh, pushed my colleagues along, <coughs> uh, when it appeared on the uh, web, it suddenly you know, spread like wildfire. Our articles appeared in the New York Times, all over. Had the biggest number of hits of any paper ever published in this field. So. It, it's obviously caught on, the fact that you can prove that uh, the brain understands beauty in mathematics the same as it does understand beauty in science. So now we come to the talks today, and um, I, just, I was given a preview before you came in of these marvellous um, objects on the table here. 
of how they're made, what they represent, but the speakers will tell you much more about them. And this is my first experience of seeing things produced by what's called 3D printing, a word that, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm prehistoric. I date from the days, I remember buying my children the first handheld pocket calculator, mm -hmm. HP 45, it cost a fortune. <laughs> and if you all you can do is add up numbers and things like that. Um, so I, I, I date, and I remember seeing visiting the first uh, EDSAC, the first electronic computer in Cambridge, full of wires and occupying the whole room. Now you do it on a little chip. And I remember when I was at school, by the way, the first speaker went to the same school as me, Manchester Grammar School. When I, I was there, uh, just after the war, and um, one of the things this school did, they took us on an outing to the university to see the computer which the university had used during the war. Now that was an analog computer. It was a computer made of wood, big table, <laughs> and lots of cogs. Now it was a bit like the original Babbage machine, and, made, made, and you, you know, a bit like these football games you play with, pulling them up things. And it, 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 it was designed to solve in, in differential equations. So it, different equations. It, was, it occupied a very large space, and it was a proper uh, machine for doing very specific tasks. That was the one we were shown. That was the one that was used Manchester during the war. So uh, it was pretty primitive. Anyway, coming back to today's lecture, the I won't give you the details of the titles. I haven't already done that. But the first talk is by Henry Zegerman, uh, and he will explain to you uh, what some of these things are. Then he will be followed by a short break by his younger colleague, who will carry on. I mean, he's, I was told that if you don't follow the first lecture, you might as well sleep during the second one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Atiyah, for the introduction. Um, turns out Saul is around five years older than I am, in fact, rather than the other way around. Um, but, uh, uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak, and thank you all for being here. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about um, four-dimensional sculpture in a sense, um, but I thought I'd uh, spend a little time uh, beforehand uh, talking about 3D printing, what, what is the technology, uh, how does it work? Um, there's a few different uh, related technologies that, that come under the title 3D printing. Um, if you've uh, seen uh, one, perhaps uh, if you have one at home, or, or if you've seen one in a university somewhere, it's likely to be some variant of, of this one. This is, this is called fused deposition modeling. And the idea is, is sort of like a glue gun. You have some nozzle which is squirting out a uh, melted uh, plastic, and it's building up and layer by layer, the object uh, that you have. And so, so the idea over here is you've got this nozzle which is squirting stuff here, and you, you need three degrees of, of movement of the build plate or, or the nozzle so that um, you can have the nozzle be exactly where you need it to be to build the object. Um, and over on the right here, I've got a, a different uh, uh, way of achieving those three degrees of freedom rather than maybe having something on rollers and, and uh, belts to move things up and down. This thing here, there are these three motors that go up and down uh, these, uh, these three vertical columns. And if you think about it, if you put those three uh, motors at the right heights, then you can get anywhere you want. You can get the nozzle to be anywhere you want inside of, inside of the space. There's an interesting problem. If you want to be at a point X, Y, Z, to what height should those three things go to? Um, so the second, I'll just mention another um, version of, of, of 3D printing called Selective laser melting. This is how all of these these were made. Uh, there's there's a there's a disadvantage with the glue gun um, idea is that suppose you have uh, say an arch that you want to build, or even worse, an arch with a dip in the middle. Then you're building things up layer by layer. And what happens when you try and when you get to the the, the start of this bump in the middle? You need to squirt your glue gun and have it hanging mid air while you continue building up before it gets connected. And this isn't going to work. So what, what you have to do is sort of build scaffolding, which you then break off later, um, which is difficult when you've got you know horribly complicated internal structure. How are you going to remove all of that scaffolding? Um, so so this uh, selective laser melting. The idea here instead is that you have um, a, a tank with a, a layer of plastic dust, um, and the tank is heated just below the melting point of the dust, and then a laser comes along, melts the dust, and makes it tack to its neighbors. And then you keep going, you put another layer of dust down, and you keep building upwards. And at the end, you have this solid vat full of dust, and you vacuum out all of the extra stuff, and you've got the thing in there. So OK, this is just a very brief uh, overview of what the technology is. Now, moving on from three dimensions to four dimensions, um, 
first of all, what is four-dimensional space? I'm, I'm sort of going to be trying to talk about four-dimensional objects. What, what is the, the, the space that they live in? And so let's take a step back first and think about three-dimensional space. So how do you describe a point in three dimensions? Obviously, you set up some, some axes, say. You say, well, I want to go so many meters, say, along this way, along the front of the room. I'm going to go so many meters forward, and I'm going to go so many meters up. And those three numbers tell you where you are in space. And so I've got this over here. And so what do you do if you're going to do four dimensions? Well, mathematicians just add an extra number. And I've run out of letters at the end of the alphabet, so I'll put one at the start. Um, so I've got four numbers, W, X, Y, and Z, and you just need to give yourself four different directions that are at right angles to each other and move in those directions a certain number of, of meters, and, and that tells you where a point in space is. Um, you might complain that this, this picture is impossible, right? That, that there's no way to arrange these four uh, directions that are all at right angles to each other. Um, and I have to agree, I mean, this picture is, is a lie, right? The, the, those... There's, uh, there's no way to arrange those four lines. But this is also a lie. There's no, this, this is a flat screen. Uh, these, these two, two uh, lines here are not at right angles. They only look like they're right angles because I drew this little thing in here with an almost square corner. Um, so, so what is this? This picture here is a picture, a three-dimensional picture that's been squished down onto the, onto the plane, onto the screen. So this is a, a projection from three dimensions to two dimensions. And it's just as much a lie as this one, which is a four-dimensional arrangement of lines which has been squished down into the, into the plane. And so, so that's the basic idea, is that we need to squish things down from four dimensions to three dimensions so that our poor three-dimensional brains can, can hope to understand them. Um, so, so let's um, think about, uh, have an example in mind that we can start thinking about how we're going to try and see this thing. So, so, so what's a hypercube? Um, so, so let's start right back at the, the beginning with something very simple. So this is just a point. And so what I've done here is I've taken a copy of the point and I've moved it to the side. Uh, and then I've joined those two points together with a line segment and I've produced this line. And so then I'm going to do this again. So, so, so now I've got a line. I'm going to take a copy of that line and I'm going to move it to the side. Uh, and I'm going to move it, in particular, I'm going to move it to the side in a direction which is perpendicular to the line that this, this line segment is part of. And then I connect up the corners, and I've made myself a square. And then I'll do it again. So here's that line again. So here, here's, here's a square. I've moved it to the side in a direction perpendicular to the plane that the square is sitting inside of. And then I kind of connect up the corners, and I make a cube. Although, again, this is not really a cube. This is, this is a squished picture. And then I do it again. So I take, take a cube, I make a copy, I move it perpendicularly to the three-dimensional space that the cube is sitting in. Got a copy, connect up all the corners, and, and that's kind of what a hypercube is. Well, this, is, so this, is, this isn't a very good picture. This tells you sort of which corners are connected to which corners. But how do I sort of see the geometry? How can I see what's going on? Is it really the case that this line goes in front of this line? What, what's happening here? So, um, so how do we see four-dimensional things? And, and I mean, sort of as I said before, we can't see four-dimensional things. Um, we're only three-dimensional people, and we're evolved in a three-dimensional environment to understand uh, two-dimensional pictures as telling us about three-dimensional things. But we can't really do four-dimensional things. We have to project them down to three dimensions, and then we can try and see what's going on. So let's, um, let's uh, take a step back and think about the problem. How are we going to understand... So, so, we're okay with three-dimensional objects. If we have a two-dimensional friend who, is, uh, who lives in this, this is the, the table top down here. If I have a, a two-dimensional friend who lives in, in the, the, the table top, or let's say, let's, uh, let's suppose that I've got a two-dimensional friend who lives on the wall, and they want to understand what a cube is, then I can, I can project uh, this cube, I can squish this cube down onto the two-dimensional wall, so that my friend can, can hopefully understand what's going on. Um, and so this is uh, called orthogonal projection. Um, perhaps that should be parallel projection. The idea, so there's many different ways of squishing a cube down onto the plane. So, so what's going on here is that the light rays, well, at least if I hold the light far enough apart, then the light rays are coming in parallel to each other, 
as they hit uh, the cube, and then they continue onwards, and they hit the wall, and the shadow is, is the, the, the parallel projection of the cube. Now, so this maybe gives you some sort of sense of, what's, uh, of what the cube is uh, for a two-dimensional person, but, but there, are some, there are some problems with this picture. So, so, uh, so our friend may say, oh, that's, that's, that's nice, so, so I've got these edges, so this edge over here is parallel to this edge over here. Is that, is that right? And you say, yes, yes, those are actually parallel edges. And then she'd say, oh, but, and then this edge here clashes into this edge here. So is that right? And you say, no, no, that's, um, yeah, sorry about that. There, there's, um, so you can see where the, the, the shadow of, I think it's this edge up here, hits uh, this bar down here. You can see that's not really an intersection between these edges. That's a, that's a lie that's given to us by the projection. So, okay, um, this isn't so great, but, but it's something to start from. What else can we do? Uh, oh, well, sorry. What we can do is we can do the same thing with a hypercube, going from four dimensions to three dimensions, and get, oh, I should be using this thing, um, and get some sort of orthogonal power of projection of a hypercube. Oh, this is difficult, this is backwards. And I'll, I'll hand all of these things around so you can... I'll hand them to Saul, and there's nobody on the road behind him. <laughs> Throw it up. <laughs> Sorry, they're difficult to break, mostly. So, uh, <laughs> back on here. That, that will become important later on. Um, okay, so what else could we use? So, so, so instead of an orthogonal projection, a parallel projection, we can do a perspective projection. So this is what you get when you, uh, you don't have your light infinitely far away, well, you could use the sun. So the sun has light rays which are pretty much coming in parallel. Um, and if instead I, I move the, the light source pretty close to the object, then I get a, a perspective projection. And what you see on the wall looks like a perspective photograph of the cube. It looks like what you might see. Um, sort of an interesting question to think about. Why does it look like uh, a photograph of a cube? And the reason is that if you imagine putting your eye where the light source is, then what you would see is the same thing as, as, what's, uh, as what's on the wall. If you just sort of reverse the direction of the light, then instead of the light coming from uh, the, 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 the torch, hitting the cube and then hitting the wall, if you reverse all of those uh, directions and you put your eye there instead, then it's exactly the same thing that you see. Anyway, so, so, um, okay, so that's perspective projection. And in fact, it's sort of worse for telling us what's actually going on with the cube, because we still have these edges crashing through each other. And now we don't have, you know, now it looks like this edge and this edge are not actually parallel uh, on the projection, although they are parallel in real life. Well, we can fix one of these problems by moving the light to a different place. So if I, so if I put the light rather than sort of uh, at a strange angle, if I put it into a face of it, then none of my edges now crash. And so this, this, this projection of the cube um, at least doesn't have the edges crashing into each other. And you can see you know, there are 12 edges. They don't intersect each other. You can see how many vertices there are, and so on. Um, and if you do this with a hypercube, and you get this guy here. So I should mention, um, so this is hypercube A. This is by Bas Hubert Grossman. Um, she's a, um, a mathematical artist who's been working with uh, 3D printing uh, longer than most people, and the previous one was called Hypercube B. Um, she named them in the wrong order, but <laughs> you did. So this is pretty good, right? I mean, we can see, um, uh, well, hold on. let me go back. I forgot to say something. This guy has edges that crash through each other. This guy doesn't have edges that crash through each other, but there's still a problem here. This edge here goes through this face here. And that doesn't happen in the real hypercube. Again, that's, that's a problem to do with the projection, squishing things down in, in a bad way, which is causing things to intersect when they shouldn't really. And here, we managed to fix that problem for the cube going from three dimensions to two dimensions. And here, we fixed that problem for the hypercube. Now, none of the edges are going through faces. But there's still a problem here again. And so let me just step back <coughs> to this one here. So the edges aren't colliding with each other in a bad way, but the faces are. So, so where are the six faces of the cube? The bottom face of the cube is down here. 
looking very nice and square, as it should be. And then there are four faces around the outside, which are <coughs> a little bit squashed and distorted, but they're, they're, they're at least not overlapping with each other. Where's the top face of the cube? <coughs> the top face of the cube covers all of the rest of them. And so there's still some, some crashing between parts of this, this object, which isn't really there in, in the true, um, true three-dimensional object. And that's true here as well. So a hypercube has eight cubes. Where are those eight cubes? There's one in the middle. There's six of them around it, which again are sort of squashed into trapezium-type shapes. And then there's an eighth one which is on the top, which is covering all of the rest of them. So we're still not quite there. We can still do a little bit better. And so how do we do this? So, so now I have to explain stereographic projection, which is what I'm going to use. This is a, a really beautiful kind of projection which we'll use to, to fix many of our problems and introduce new problems, but that's how it works. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, so here's an object. Oops. Every movement I make is backwards. Um, and uh, so this is sort of a spherical object, and it has a pattern on it. And what is this pattern about? When I do the, the trick with the, the torch, all will become clear. So if I put it in just the right place, then I get a square grid, which is what was on the sphere to start with. It's just a distorted version of the sphere, uh, sorry, a distorted version of the, the grid on the uh, on the sphere. I'm also going to have to stand in the right orientation so that the, uh, the light's going perpendicular to the, uh, to the wall, which is difficult because if you look at it, this wall is not at right angles to this wall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, um, so this is, uh, so, so what is stereographic projection? It's a map, um, it's, a, it's a function that, that maps from the sphere to the plane. And so, so what's going on here is there's a light point, a point light source which is at the north pole of this sphere, and uh, a line of light, light is approximately a straight line, um, comes along here and hits um, the, the sphere in one point, and it hits the plane in one point. And so the map is, um, take the point that uh, the, light, the light ray hits on the sphere, and that maps to the point on the plane. And um, so the stere stereographic projection has many beautiful properties, which I'll, and I'll come to, to quite a few of them shortly. Uh, one of them you can see already here. So, let's uh, put this up here. So the, the, grid, on the, um, the grid on the plane is, is uh, a grid of squares. So all of these uh, lines intersect each other at right angles. And that's also true on the plane. It's a little hard to see because these are, these are arcs of circles rather than straight lines. But they all uh, intersect each other at right angles. And so what's one of the properties of stereographic projection is it's conformal. It preserves, um, it preserves angles. Uh, if you have two lines that cross over on the sphere, they cross at a given angle. On the plane, they will also <coughs> cross the same. I'll pass this around. Um, I won't give you the, the, the torch, because I need it for greater things. But I can look at it. Um, so how are we going to get a picture of the cube for our two-dimensional friend? Uh, using stereographic projection. So, well, the first thing we have to do is get it onto the sphere. Um, because stereographic projection is a map from the sphere, and at the moment I've got a cube. So the first thing we do is, is radially project the cube onto the sphere. So this is a little tricky to see what's going on there um, in, in the photograph. So here's my light source again. Here's the cube. And this is sort of a spherical shell. It's actually, it's actually this, uh, this spherical shell here. Um, and and the cube is sort of sitting inside of here, and we're, we're projecting light rays uh, from the center of the sphere and the center of the cube out onto the sphere. So over on the, the left there, you can see the, the sort of animation. You, you turn a cube into a beach ball cube. And then we stereographically project this now that we've got it onto the sphere. So here's this, uh, this sort of beach ball cube. And uh, if I do this right, then, then that's uh, approximately what the, the image looks like. Um, and you can, you can see again the, uh, um, the, the angle-preserving property of, of uh, stereographic projection. Um, the, uh, the angles at the corners of this cube are uh, 120 degrees, and it's a little tricky to, um, to see. Maybe you don't quite believe me. These angles are 120 degrees as well. And the, these angles here, they're more obviously 
120 degrees. Um, the ones on the outside are as well. And if you do the same thing, uh, one dimension up, then you get a half cube. All right, and here it is. Um, and this is our, this is, I guess, what we think is the best picture of a hype cube that you can get. So um, it doesn't crash into itself. Um, I see. So, so how do we solve this? This we solve this problem of uh, the, the the faces of the cube crashing into each other. Because now, where where are the where are the the six faces of the cube? There's one in the middle. There's four of them arranged around there, and then the top face actually goes outside here. And so, uh, stereographic projection maps from the sphere to the entire plane, and it's one to one. Every point of the sphere gets a point on the plane. Well, actually, that's not quite true. There's one point of the sphere that doesn't get mapped onto the plane. The North Pole itself uh, doesn't go anywhere. It sort of goes off to infinity. But every, everywhere else, you, you, you get a point on the plane. And so, and so the same thing is true here as well. Just let me, uh, in, uh, for the hypercube, the four-dimensional uh, version of the cube, here's, here's a computer render which shows the faces as well. Unfortunately, you can't do everything with 3D printing. Um, if we printed this, it wouldn't look very good. You'd just get these solid uh, sort of spherical windows. But so where are the eight cubes of this? There's one in the middle. There are uh, one, two, six of these uh, arranged around the middle one, and then the eighth one is outside. And we're actually sitting inside of the eighth cube for this photograph. Uh, okay, so um, just because it's so awesome, um, I have to talk a little bit more about uh, stereographic projection, show you a couple more of these um, these illustrations. So, so, so this here is um, a sphere marked with um, lots of little triangles. Um, these these uh, triangles are sort of based on the, the uh, tiling of uh, the dodecahedron and uh, the, well, the tiling of the sphere by the pattern of the symmetries of the dodecahedron and of the icosahedron. And so you uh, project this onto the wall, then you get this, uh, this really beautiful pattern. Um, and again, uh, angles are preserved. So seeing this, I guess, uh, a little difficult to see. Um, on this, uh, it's difficult to gesture and hold the light <laughs> and the thing at the same time. But, um, but on this, on this uh, maybe if I put it over here, uh, it takes a while to, to remember that it's looking at uh, a different thing. So there are these angles of, um, there are these 90 degree angles, say here, these are angles of 90 degrees, these are 60 degrees, and these ones are 30 degrees, 36? 36. 36. And, um, and those are replicated again on the uh, on the wall. You get you get the same angles here. And then just one more. This this again. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, this again. This is uh, another design based on the the uh, dodecahedron and the icosahedron. There's a circle for each face of the dodecahedron, and another circle for each face of the icosahedron. They're sort of dually related to each other, and you see that same kind of on here, I just wanted to mention one more amazing property of stereographic projection, which I really will need the assistance of my lovely assistant, Saul. Um, so, so stereographic projection not only preserves angles, it also preserves circles. So there are all these circles on the surface of the, the sphere, and there are also <laughs> circles on this. Oh, this is a great one. So, so, so this, uh, all of these, these big circles with the pentagons are the same size on the sphere, but they get different sizes on the plane. And there's another very strange thing going on, which is that the center of this circle over on the, the plane is somewhere around here. But the center of the circle on the sphere is in the middle of this five-pointed star, which is somewhere around there. So, so stereographic projection knows that circles should be circles, but it doesn't know where the centers go. So it gets kind of confused. Anyway, thank you, Saul. sit down again. Until, until it's your turn to actually talk. <laughs> okay, so that's there you go. Projection. Um, oh, so so yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to say we skipped through quite quickly when we were building a hypercube, right? So what what was the plan? We start with a cube, we make a beach ball cube by projecting it onto the sphere, and then we stereographically project from that. 
And then I just said, do the same thing one dimension up. What does that mean? Take a hypercube, I radially project it onto something, the sphere in four dimensional space, um, and then stereographically project from that. So, so what, is, what is the sphere in four dimensional space? Well, a sphere is just a set of points at a fixed distance from some central point. So how can we understand this? Um, so again, let's go back to three dimensions. So a sphere in three dimensions, well, everybody knows what this looks like. Um, and again, I've, I'm using stereographic projection to, to try and understand this. Um, and I want you to, to focus on a couple of things. So, so this is, um, so before we had a beach ball cube, this is, this is a beach ball octahedron. So we've got uh, an equator, and then we've got these lines of longitude, I guess. Um, and so I've stereographically projected these onto the plane, and notice that there are eight triangles on the sphere, and so there are eight triangles on the plane. Four of them in the middle look like sort of reasonable triangles, except there's a curvy edge to them. Uh, and they're all obviously the same. And then there are these four triangles around the outside, which don't look like triangles at all, but they are really triangles. And the, and the way to convince yourself that they're really triangles is you look down here, and you look up here, and you say, well, those are obviously the same. So these two must obviously be the same as well. OK, everybody happy with this? Now, one dimension up. We don't have a beach ball octahedron, we have something called a beach ball 16 cell. So rather than, so here we had four triangles in the middle. Uh, these are the four triangles in the southern hemisphere, uh, to the south of the equator. And then we had four triangles in the northern hemisphere. Here we have eight tetrahedra in the southern hyperhemisphere. The equator of the, the sphere in four dimensional space is a two dimensional sphere. That's not surprising. The equator in three-dimensional space is a circle. That's sort of a one-dimensional sphere. So the equator in four-dimensional space, the equator of the sphere in four-dimensional space, is a sphere. Oh, gosh. And so there are eight tetrahedra inside, and then there are eight tetrahedra outside. And they look really stretched out and weird, but they're the same, for the same reason that these guys are the same over here. So, so we've got a tetrahedron here in the middle facing us, and there's another big one out here that, I, again, I think we're inside of. And the reason that the background has got this red, green, and blue is because those are these red, green, and blue edges that are intersecting out here in the same way that they're intersecting uh, at a point um, on the equator there. So hopefully that gives you some sense of what the, 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 the sphere in four-dimensional space is. So the sphere in three-dimensional space under stereographic projection is the same as the plane together with one point, the North Pole. The sphere in four dimensions is the same as three-dimensional space together with one point at the North Pole. Okay, because so I'll hand, hand that around as well. Um, so let me talk about uh, polytopes for a little bit. Um, so polytopes are some of the, the simplest shapes um, in, uh, in, I guess, any, any dimension. So, uh, so in two dimensions, we all, we all know the regular polygons. So we've got the triangle, the square, the pentagon, and so on, and they keep going forever. You can just increase the number of edges, and you get more and more regular polygons. What does regular mean? I'm going to be a little bit imprecise, um, but roughly speaking, uh, so there has to be symmetries of, of the object that take any face to any other face. Um, so in three dimensions, we've got all these regular polygons. There's an infinite many of them. In three dimensions, there are only three, uh, sorry, only five regular polyhedra. So we've already seen the cube. We just mentioned the octahedron. There's also the tetrahedron, the dodecahedron, and the icosahedron, well known from shapes of dice. Um, so these fall into, into so the, the, the regular uh, polytopes is the, the n-dimensional version of a polyhedron or a polygon. And these fall into, into some families. So we already saw one of these families, the polygons. In two dimensions, you have this infinite string of uh, regular polygons. And then there are three other families. We already saw this one here. So this, was, this is how I was making a hypercube. You start with a point, you double it, you, you, you move it over, you connect up with lines, you do it again, you get a square, you do it again, you get a cube, you do it again, you get a hypercube. And this continues in all dimensions. You just keep going on. And then there are two other ways you can do things. So, so this is the sort of tetrahedral uh, family. So it starts off the same, but then, then going from here to here, what do we do? We've got a, a line segment 
we choose a point not on that line segment. We move it away perpendicularly to uh, the line that the line segment is in, and then connect that one point to all of the other existing points, and we get a triangle. If we do that again, we take a triangle, we make a new point moved away from the plane that the triangle's in, connect up the lines, we get a tetrahedron, and then so on. This is something called the, the pentacoron or the, the five cell, um, and that goes on forever. And then there's one more family down here where rather than making one new point off of the, the line, we make two. So we have a line, we make two new points which are away from the, the line which, is, uh, which contains this line segment, and we get a, a diamond shape, also known as a square. Do the same thing again, so I've got the square sitting in a plane, take two points uh, away from that plane in opposite directions, connect them up, you get an octahedron. This is something called the 16 cell, and this continues forever. And then there's, so this is four infinite families, the polygons and then these three things that go between dimensions. And then there are some exceptions, and these are the only exceptions. There's the dodecahedron and the icosahedron in three dimensions. Uh, there's something called the 24 cell in four dimensions, which is just bizarre, it's off on its own. There's something called the 120 cell in four dimensions, which is sort of a four dimensional version of the dodecahedron. And there's something called the 600 cell, um, also in four dimensions, which is uh, the four dimensional version of the icosahedron. Um, now you'll notice that, that these are photographs of 3D prints, and these are not. And there's a reason for this, is that these things are enormous. Um, and so instead, we only print half of them. So, um, so this is, uh, over here, this is half of the 120 cell. So I'll put this down as well. Oops. So this is half of the 120 cell cut along the equator. Remember, the equator is a sphere in four-dimensional space, or in, the, in the, the sphere in four-dimensional space. And over here, I've got the, the 120, uh, sorry, the 600 cell. Oh, so I should mention the 120 cell is made from 120 dodecahedra. So just as the, the dodecahedron has 12 pentagonal faces, the 120 cell has 120 um, dodecahedral faces. The 600 cell, guess what, has 600 tetrahedral cells. Great, so let me hand these around. Okay, so, so in my last uh, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about um, a project Saul and I worked on investigating the 120 cell and making puzzles out of it. So here is the 120 cell again. Um, let's, let's put this one back. And as I said, it has 120 dodecahedral three-dimensional things. It has 720 penta pentagonal faces, <coughs> 1,200 edges, and 600 vertices, which is a lot. It's sort of difficult to get your, your head around what this thing is. Um, so, so, let's, um, so let's try and make things easier for ourselves and start simple and sort of build up. So one way to, to understand what's going on with the 120 cell is to look at layers of dodecahedron. So there's one central dodecahedron right in the center of, of that 120 cell. And so I've got a picture over here. This is sort of a schematic picture. Uh, this is my, my light source at the north pole of, of this sphere. And here's this dodecahedron down at the south pole. This is in the center of the projection. And around this, there are 12 dodecahedra, which are right next to it. And so this angle here. Uh, pi over 5, so, so on the sphere you measure distances by angles. It's the same thing on the sphere, and so here we are. Um, there are 12 dodecahedra right next to it at angle pi over, four, uh, over 5. There are 20 more arranged around it at angle pi over 3. 12 more arranged at an angle of 2 pi over 5 away from the south pole. 30 dodecahedra at angle pi over 2, 90 degrees. So this is halfway. This is the equator. Um, so these 30 dodecahedra are all cut in half along the, the, wherever it is, the 120 cell, there it is. Um, there are all these half dodecahedra where the equator is cut them in, in, in half. And then this repeats uh, in reverse order in the last four layers, and if you add up all of those numbers, uh, trust me, you get 120. Um, here's another way to understand how these dodecahedra are arranged inside of this object. So you can make it out of rings of 10 dodecahedra. So what is this ring? So we start in a dodecahedra, and we decide to walk out of this dodecahedron through a pentagonal face. And we get into another dodecahedron here. And dodecahedra have opposite faces. So you can say, well, I came in this way. I'm going to keep going and go out the opposite face of the dodecahedron. And keep going around. And it turns out that after visiting 10 dodecahedra, you get back to where you started. 
Now, if you start somewhere else nearby, going roughly in the same direction, you can make another ring, and these rings wrap around each other. Um, in fact, if you keep going, you can wrap five rings around this central, so I have this central gray ring. I've, I've drawn in four of these rings, and there's a fifth one, the sort of uh, Death Star channel here, that I can fill in now, and, and uh, I guess that's how you project, protect the Death Star, you fill in all the channels, so you, know, you can fly in there. Anyway, so, um, so, so I've got five rings that are surrounding the original gray one. Um, and this is half, this is again half of the 120 cell. So each ring had 10 dodecahedra. There was one in the middle, there were five around it, that makes six rings of 10 dodecahedra each, which is 60 dodecahedra. Um, and the other half consists of five, more, sorry, six more rings that wrap all around these. So there's the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth. Wait, I was off. I was off. Let's try that one. Seventh. Yes, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th. And again, we're inside of the last one, as usual. So the 11th ring goes, uh, sorry, the 12th ring goes down through the middle here. And so that gives us 120 cells. So um, we wanted to 3D print this, because that's what we do. Um, and there's this problem when you're 3D printing something. You have to arrange the objects in space um, so that, well, if you want the rings to be separate and, and allowed to move apart from each other, you can't have them touching each other when it goes in the printer, because you'll get it out of the printer and they'll just be solid. They, they, they won't be able to move. So you have to arrange them somehow so they don't touch. We wanted to do five, and we can only actually do three. This is, um, this is what this, uh, this thing is here. Um, so here's this, this central ring, um, and then two of the, uh, the other rings wrapping around it. Um, and this works, and it does, actually does some kind of cool things. It was dangerous to do this uh, live. Oh, there we go. So, so now I've got this one wrapping around the central ring. And if I do this, hopefully, there we go. So th there's two of them wrapping around the central ring. So, uh, well, we really wanted to do five. Um, and so we decided to cheat. Uh, okay, so here it is. Play with it. Make it come apart. So, so we can't print all of these things interlinked because they're all fused together. So instead, we'll just get rid of some of the, the dodecahedra. So I'll just remove these four, these four biggest dodecahedra to make um, this gently curving string of dodecahedra, which you call the rib, because um, it's gently curving and made out of dodecahedra. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then we can put five of these in around this central ring, and this just works fine. Um, let's actually remove the central ring and just have this, this ring this ring-like object of five things here. And what we've done for ourselves is we've created ourselves a puzzle. Because you have to print these things separately so they won't be fused together. And then you have to put them together to make the thing. And that's what this, uh, oops, that's what this thing is. And so um, here it is. Uh, these are, well, just to prove <laughs> that it's a puzzle here. That, so there are 10 dodecahedra in, in the whole ring. And we've removed the four biggest ones to leave uh, only six. And now, this is very dangerous, trying to put it back together on camera live. Oh gosh. I'm looking at this. If it doesn't look good on the screen, I'm sorry, but. Um, there we go. Should I get a round of applause? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so you can break that if you want, but then somebody has to put it. Um, right, so uh, so this so we call this the DC30 ring puzzle. It looks like a ring. The D stands for dodecahedra. The C stands for the cell center projection because the north pole is in the center of a cell, um, and it's 30 because there are 30 dodecahedra in this puzzle. Um, here's another way to de decompose um, uh, ribs of uh, of the or these rings. So here's a here's a chain of five dodecahedra. The, this is the straight one. So we were inside of this one, going down through uh, the other 11 rings. And so you can wrap these, these little short uh, pieces, these sh little short ribs around here. There's, um, I'm telling you how to do the puzzle, by the way. Um, so, so there are five of these little short ribs around here, another five around here, and you get um, something we call the DC45 Meteor Puzzle. Um, and this, this thing here has, it has this beautiful uh, dodecahedral symmetry. 
and it's made out of these uh, 11 pieces here. Um, if you're interested afterwards, I have lots and lots of, uh, of small pieces, and you can try these puzzles out. Um, so, so we decided, uh, uh, we, we finalized on having six different kinds of ribs to make things with. So there's the spine, and then there's uh, length four guys uh, that are sort of wrapping directly around the spine, or, or length six version. The difference between this and this is just that the, the, the biggest dodecahedra has been removed. And then there are these uh, slightly more curving guys which wrap around those. And then there's a, an equator piece that is actually on the equator of the, um, of the, the, uh, um, of the, the sphere in four-dimensional space. Uh, and with these, you can make all kinds of puzzles. Um, so uh, we were quite surprised, actually, at how many things you can make. So, so, so this sort of twisting around pattern of these rings, something called uh, is sort of a, a combinatorial version of the hop vibration. Hop vibration is a very important uh, uh, object in algebraic topology. And there's a version of this made out of dodecahedra. And, and the two that I've shown you already, they all have this pattern of these, these ribs that are curving around each other and twisting, and, then, and they all uh, follow that, that hop vibration. There are many others, others that, that don't uh, follow them at all. Um, well, so you've been looking at this for 30 seconds, so now I get to ask you a puzzle. Um, two of these are photographs of the same object, <laughs> seen from different directions. And I just realized that I have to build that object in order to convince you that they are. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about. Do you want me to build I think I can do it. Um, Actually, I lied. There were two pairs of objects here which are the same as each other, taken from different directions. Oh, how many more of these do I need? I need this one here. I'll get it. Um, this one goes here. Any ideas? Two and twelve. Sorry, say again? Two and twelve. Two and twelve. Close, but no. <laughs> um, there we go. There we go. There is. And any other any other guesses? Any? Well, it's essentially it? impossible. <laughs> you don't think it's impossible, Saul? Do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> um, what about two? Looks like it should go with something. How about two and eleven? Uh, well, this one has a hole, and this one doesn't. Well, maybe we're not looking along the right axis. <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed. I think I just better give this away. Um, so let's see. This. I'm just going to stand this side. So that... Okay, so this is number... I can't see it anymore. Oh. Seven. Seven. Nine. 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 Number nine? Yeah, nine. Yeah, yeah. Nine. That's number two. Yeah, so number two and number nine are the same, and number four and number eleven are the same. So, but it's because you rotate from. Yeah. So what's the message here? Um, you should come and play with these because the photographs are just not going to. So I'm going to have an idea. Um, that's my talk. Thanks very much. Um, if you have any questions, we'll have a quick break and then and then we'll go on to talk.